Hey guys, David and Jason Benham. We were at Liberty so many years ago and we remember being in all the convos and today's a very special convo talking about life. And, and, and here's the cool thing is that after convo is over with in front of the Montview building, it's the Liberty Life March. So we want to invite you to come out there and to join us. The rot is so much better than it was when we were at school in the 90s, but you're gonna be starving. Skip the rot today, go out to Montview, and then you can hit the rot afterwards. It's open a lot longer than it was when we were there anyway. And your professors are cool with it. So we'll see you out there in front of Montview. Good morning. Welcome to our special March for Life Convo. As a way of introduction, I would like to remind all of us why we are pro-life in the womb and out of the womb. As Christians, we believe the Bible's teaching that all people are created in the image of God. Genesis 1:27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We know that God formed our inward parts and that he knitted us together in our mother's womb, as David wrote in Psalm 139. We also believe that before we were even born, God knew us and he had a plan for our lives. As God says about the prophet Jeremiah, and it's true for me and for you too. Therefore, I formed you in the womb. I knew you and before you were born, I consecrated you, says God. As Christians, we're called to love what God loves and we hate, we're supposed to hate what God hates. Psalm 9710 says, O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. We love all people, but we're to oppose evil and to stand in support of people who cry for help in times of distress. And that is why, as Christians, we're pro-life. What does it mean to be pro-life? It starts with the sanctity of life in the mother's womb. Jesus Christ, our Savior, he entered the world through his mother's womb. Therefore, we have the highest regard for a mother and her child. Since the Supreme Court's Roe versus Wade decision of 1973, more than 60 million abortions have taken place in the United States of America. Last year alone, estimates say over 600,000 abortions took place in the United States. Worldwide, over 42 million abortions took place last year. 42 million individuals that God formed in the womb like me and like you. They were denied the opportunity to live. Abortion is the leading cause of death in the world today. We deeply care about mothers in crisis pregnancy. We deeply care about those who have experienced an abortion. Did you know that for every abortion clinic in operation, there are three crisis pregnancy centers ready to help mothers, ready to help you, help those who need love and support at this time in their life. When we say we're pro-life, we mean both the mother and her child. Today, you're going to hear from some special women about the importance of the pro-life cause and how you can get involved and are get help for yourself. Please welcome the Liberty Worship Collective. I'm looking at a masterpiece. I'm staring at a work of art. I'm listening to a symphony in every beat of your tiny heart. You used to be a choice to make. Now I think you've chosen me Cause I see ten fingers, ten toes, two eyes And I know this is meant to be Oh, I don't believe in accidents Miracles, they don't just happen by chance As long as my God holds the world in his hands I know that there's no such thing as unfair Broken turns so beautiful I see you right before my eyes And every single breath you breathe This destiny love has brought to life I thought this was my story's end 
But now the future's all I see Instead of asking who you might have been I'm wondering who you're gonna be Cause I don't believe in accidents Miracles, they don't just happen by chance As long as my God holds the world in Such thing as unfair Every life deserves a voice Every child deserves a chance You are more than just a choice Oh, there's no such thing as unfair Every life deserves a voice Every child deserves a chance You are more than just a choice Cause there's no such thing as unplanned Every life deserves a voice Every child deserves a chance You are more than just a choice Oh, there's no such thing as unplanned Thank you, Worship Collective, for that amazing song. I'm Ryan Helfenbein with the Falkirk Center. Welcome to a special Liberty for Life Convo. We have an important lineup of speakers this morning. Allie Beth Stuckey is up next. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. What an amazing opportunity to get to speak to students passionate for life, passionate about the gospel. This year, more than ever, it is vital for us to march for life which means marching against opposition, against attempts to silence, demean, and demonize, marching against efforts to dehumanize the most vulnerable, marching for the right of all Americans, including babies in the womb, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we are facing, maybe more than ever, challenges to our cause. And not just when it comes to sticking up for babies, but for all issues Christians are obligated and inspired by the Holy Spirit to march for. Most Christians that I speak to have this feeling. It's almost like this inexplicable feeling and this ominous feeling that something is about to happen, that things are about to get really tough for Christians, tougher maybe than it's ever been for us in the United States. It's almost like we're all bracing ourselves for impact. Like we see this kind of hostility on the horizon. We know it's coming. We don't know what it's going to look like or feel like, how difficult it will be. But we sense that perhaps true Christian persecution is on the march towards the United States. And when I or other Christians say something like this, we are very often met with eye rolls or we're accused of having some kind of victimhood complex. We're even reminded that actually Christians have unmatched and unwarranted privilege and, and power in the United States that's harmful and needs to be diminished. And to an extent, it is certainly true that Christians in America have enjoyed many of our views being mainstream. Christianity, even if in name only, has laid the foundation for our founding documents for a very long time. It shaped our school curriculum. It influenced the standards of appropriate media entertainment. It colored our cultural consciousness, and it centered itself in many of our elections. Going to church was a part of life. It was necessary to having community, to having good standing in your town. Uh, possibly expanded your job prospects. Church served as the hub as uh, of friendships and matchmaking. Regardless of one's actual relationship with Christ, church going and the basic tenets of Christianity have been for centuries inextricably intertwined with everyday life in America. It was Alexis de Tocqueville in his extensive research on American life who remarked that the most unique and extraordinary characteristic of the United States, the thing that set us apart, was our religion, our Christianity. And so despite many of our failures, the ideals of treating people equally on the basis of us all being created equal by God and given certain unalienable rights by him is what made us different than every other nation that has ever lived. It served as the inspiration for righting our wrongs and the water that rapidly grew the seed of liberty into a blossoming tree of success and prosperity for people of all stations from all over the world. Christianity, both here and abroad, is by the grace of God, 
responsible for incredible human flourishing, not just by serving as the foundation of property rights, the sanctity of human life and for individual liberty, but by our service, feeding the poor, clothing the vulnerable, building orphanages, caring for widows, constructing hospitals, supplying the tools for entrepreneurship, sharing the gospel. That doesn't mean that those bearing the name of Christ have always gotten it right or have been on the correct side of every issue because we haven't. But some of history's most courageous figures from William Wilberforce to Corey Tin Boom have been motivated by the gospel of Christ to help those in need and to seek real biblical justice for the truly oppressed. Even while Christians have been compelled by the love of Christ to do great good for our fellow man, we have continued to be throughout history the most persecuted religious group throughout the world. And to this day, our brothers and sisters are imprisoned, they're tortured, they're martyred for their faith in Christ. They're faced with sacrifice that you and I can hardly imagine. The religious liberty and yes, perhaps even the privilege and the prominence that Christians have had in America over the last few centuries is the exception in Christian history, not the rule. Hatred of Christians has been the norm. Opposition has been the norm. Persecution has been the norm. It is in the West where Christians have been uniquely and exceptionally able to live and worship and lead freely. And now we see and we hear and we feel that Christianity, true biblical Christianity, the kind that requires taking up a cross, is being pushed to the margins. The only acceptable kind of Christianity today is that which mirrors mainstream, uh, mainstream politics and mainstream ideas so closely in its uh, views on, on sin and salvation and sexuality and the sanctity of life and morality that you can hardly tell the difference between the two. All else has become synonymous with bigotry, even harmfulness. Whether it is a lawsuit that's launched at a Christian florist for exercising her faith in her business or legislation that seeks to coerce nuns to supply birth control or Christian adoption agencies from operating according to their biblical values, whether it's censorship or slander, unjust condemnation or cancel culture, Christians in America are already facing forms of persecution that are putting some people's faith to the test. And how do we know it's putting faith to the test? because of the level of compromise that we see among our friends in our churches, even from the pulpit, giving up and giving in on the hard parts of Christianity, neglecting to talk about the political topics like the sanctity of marriage and life, about the differences in social justice and biblical justice, not realizing that these are not primarily political topics for Christians at all, but they're theological ones. And we haven't even seen real persecution here yet. We're just beginning to see Christianity being pushed out of the mainstream and into the margins. And already many of us can't handle the opposition. We're scared of being, uh, of being called a bigot. We're scared of getting mean messages on Instagram or feeling awkward with our friends or getting bad grades in class when Christians around the world and throughout history have been jailed and beheaded for their faith. We are kidding ourselves if we think that when faced with the prospect of death, we will proclaim the gospel and stand up for that, which is good and right and true. If right now we're refusing to do so because we're faced with the prospect of criticism. This week, I had a conversation with Andrew Brunson, the missionary to Turkey who was imprisoned for two years there for sharing the gospel. Someone who has dealt with the kind of persecution that most of us have never even come close to enduring. Uh, he told me that he shares my feeling and the feeling of a lot of Christians right now that something's coming here in the United States, that a wave of hostility towards Christians is on the way, that America is going to change and Christians are going to be seen as the ones standing in the way of so-called progress, that the only acceptable form of Christianity will be that which looks just like the world. And those who truly follow Christ will be aggressively pushed to the side. And because American Christians are so used to comfort, because we are so used to our cozy position in the mainstream, many of us are very fearful. We just want to avoid discomfort for as long as possible. Some are falling, falling away. Uh, some of our friends, our fellow church members, our pastors are compromising, are trying so hard to be friends with the world that they've abandoned friendship with Christ. And the Bible tells us that these two friendships are mutually exclusive. I strongly feel that it's going to get a lot harder to proclaim the name of Christ here in this incredible country whose successes would have been impossible without the tenets of Christianity. It will be much harder to deny ourselves and to follow Christ, to live in the world and not of it, to reject worldly dogmas, the subversion of absolute truth, the denial of moral order. 
The world will tolerate Christians less and less, but the world will need Christianity more and more. A world hostile to the gospel still needs the gospel. The world resistant to truth still needs the truth. A world that denies Christ needs Christ. The world who rejects the service and the kindness of, and love of Christians needs the service and the kindness and the love of Christians. The poor still need to be fed when the politicians who campaign on helping them inevitably fail. Babies in the womb need champions when the people in the White House and Congress have made it their mission to ensure as many of them are murdered as possible. Children still need to be loved and discipled and raised in goodness and truth when their schools are instilling them with lies. Truth still has to be declared when the political and cultural powers that be insist that men or women, that life starts whenever we want, that right is wrong and two plus two equals five. And if Christians won't do these things, even when pressed, even when pressured, even when, yes, persecuted, very few others, if any, will. God did not place you and me here in this country at this time on accident. So many people, myself included, find ourselves longing for a simpler time when Christianity was more acceptable, when it wasn't so scandalous to have beliefs that align with the Bible. But we've got to let that nostalgia go. That time has come and gone and it's not for us. God has for this generation something different, different than what our parents and our grandparents who lived in America had. He has different tasks for us, a different calling, maybe a very heavy calling, one that may make us cry out to God and ask him to let this cup pass from us. But ultimately, we'll have to model our prayers after Jesus and say, not my will, but your will. God did not place those of us who know him here and now accidentally or arbitrarily. It is not in his nature to do anything haphazardly. As R.C. Sproul famously said, there is not a single maverick molecule in the entire universe. He is in perfect, sovereign control over all of it. Not even this past year was any surprise for him. He was before, in, through, and over all of it. He planned for you to be born at the exact hour you were born in for the exact purpose that he has for you, for this generation, and for his church. He did not place us here, Christians, to be safe, to be comfortable, to be quiet, to blend in, to stay silent on the hard things so we can fit in with our friends, so we can be liked, so we can get good grades or even get a decent job. We have all of eternity for safety and comfort and ease. But for right now, for the tiny blip on the span of eternity that represents our lives, we are to be uncomfortable. We're to be unpopular, to be loud, to stand out, to preach the gospel unapologetically, to obey Christ with all that we have, to do the good work that he has called us to do in fighting for the vulnerable and those who have no voice. The charge for us is no different than the charge for Christians 2,000 years ago. Love God with everything you have, love your neighbor as yourself, and from these two things, make disciples of all nations, seek true biblical justice, do selfless and good work, and refuse to obey any tyrant if it means disobeying God. Christians have been a thorn in the side of tyrants from the beginning of our existence, not because of political might or because of cultural sway, but because of our dogged insistence upon doing what God calls us to do despite the consequences. Silence our speech, we continue to preach the gospel. Take away our property and livelihood, we'll find a way to be generous. Murder babies, we'll do whatever we can to save them. Ban the Bible, we hide God's word in our heart. Prohibit church, we'll meet in secret. Threaten us with imprisonment, we'll preach the gospel to our inmates. Threaten us with death, we count it all as a loss because to live is Christ and to die is gain. There's nothing you can take from us because our prize is Christ and he is ours forever. His promises are sure. His purposes can't be thwarted. His plans can't be hindered. He promises to one day come back to defeat sin and evil and sadness and injustice and sickness forever. And then and only then will it be perfectly revealed who's on the right side of history and who's not. And Christians, because of his grace, rather than any of our goodness, can have perfect confidence that the discomfort and the opposition and even the persecution we feel today is not only temporary, but worth it creating for us a far greater glory that outweighs all of our troubles here. The least we will be called to do in the coming ages is march. 
And yet doing so is a representation of our commitment to move forward steadfastly in obedience to Christ, in defense of the most vulnerable, marching for the lives of those we have been charged with speaking for and protecting. So today resolve not to back down, to not fit in, be quiet, live comfortably or conveniently, but rather to obey God and to work for his glory every day and at all costs, not just when it comes to the lives of the unborn, but when it comes to all things to which God has called us. Thank you. Thank you, Ali, for that powerful testimony and message for life. I'm honored to be joined by my friend, Christine Yergin, who is the co-founder of Colorado for Life and Be Their Village, a Christian nonprofit that is dedicated to connecting mothers in crisis pregnancy to resources within the pro-life community. Christine, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, we're, the honor and pleasure is all ours and mine. And um, I just wanted to, to first just talk about your ministry was really birthed out of a story, a personal yeah. story that you had. We're joined by your son Noah this morning. Mm -hmm. Tell us your story. Yeah, so uh, in college, I, I had a unplanned pregnancy hmm. and um, was overwhelmingly pressured to abort. And... Um, ultimately chose life and Noah's here because of that, which is an absolutely beautiful thing. And when you, when you look at Noah, you see a child, not a choice, um, which is what so many people say a child is. It's, it's not, it's an actual child. There's so many women out there who are contemplating abortion mm. um, or who may find themselves pregnant. And, and I hope that seeing Noah is that visible confirmation that yes, a child is not a choice and life is always the right answer. Mm. Just, just for those who might be listening, and I think about, I think about girls who um, right now are, are, are contemplating abortion. And then there are those who had an abortion. Yeah. Okay, so really two, two different groups, mm -hmm. uh, but, but really there's hope for both. Absolutely. And I wanted you to talk a little, because we've been, we've been talking about this uh, quite a bit for those who are in that moment where they're really contemplating maybe even taking a pill mm -hmm. uh, what would you say to them you know first and foremost if you're pregnant and you haven't taken the pill yet you're absolutely not alone you're not alone I'm walking testament of that um, the this lie that we can't have our children and have all of our dreams and goals met is is exa exactly that, it's a lie. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not alone, there's a huge pro-life movement behind you willing to support. I'm a, in that movement and I'm willing to walk along aside anybody who is in that situation. And then for those who have potentially even taken the pill, there is such a thing as an abortion pill reversal. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people know about it. Explain what that is. Yeah, a lot of people, um, or the abortion industry will bury that. They don't want you to know about it um, because they essentially don't want you to know that there's regret. But through the abortion pill reversal, if you have taken the first abortion pill, within 72 hours, you can do a reversal, which essentially is pumping your body full of progesterone because the first abortion pill will cut that off. Um, and there's a 68% chance that your baby will make it. So it is a very time sensitive issue. Um, but if you have taken the first pill, the thing to do is go find the abortion pill reversal. You can, uh, Blue Ridge Pregnancy Center here can help you and mm. then abortionpillreversal.com mm. can assign you to a location near you if you're not in Lynchburg. You're also ministering to those who are hurting and they, they've had an abortion. Yeah. Um, they're in the Colorado community. Be Their Village is a way that you're connecting women to advocacy in the pro-life movement in your community, mm. to churches, to Christians. What would you say to a mother who has had an abortion and she is feeling this weight of condemnation, she's feeling this weight of shame. I think the statistic is something like four in 10 uh, uh, churchgoers yeah. uh, are, are actually have had an abortion. What would you say to her? What's her hope? We love you. Mm -hmm. God loves you. God doesn't make mistakes. You are his child and um, there's hope and healing. I mean, through God's forgiveness and His grace, uh, I have experienced that, you know, just from sin in general. But women who are hurting and in pain, they need this grace and forgiveness, and it's out there. It's mm. out there. And us as the hands and feet of Christ are called to help these women who are in these situations. It's not just, a, you know, God deals with them, God forgives them, and that's between them and God. 
we need to also be there for them and help them find these resources because there are things like counseling, a lot of free things that we can guide these women to. And if we know about them, mm. then we can send them on their way to, to finding that counseling and um, the help that they need to heal, essentially. I think there is this, there's a tremendous weight and a feeling of condemnation, of yeah. shame. And, and, and Satan, who is the accuser, mm -hmm. he often lies to us and he tells us, yeah, you can never be forgiven of that. Um, you know, it, it's a reminder of what the gospel teaches and yeah. preaches ultimately that Jesus Christ died for our sin, every single sin. The, Paul, who was the murderer, mm -hmm. right, literally said, there is therefore now no condemnation yeah. for those who are in Christ in Romans 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. We know that as Christians, Jesus Christ paid the penalty of that sin, yeah. that we can have forgiveness. And so that's hope even for a young mother who has just gone through this, has mm -hmm. walked through this. And there's also hope on the other end of this too, that not only can she be forgiven, but we believe, according to Scripture, the promises of Scripture, she can be reunited with her child yeah. one day. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those things that sometimes the church can do a better job in, in loving on these women. Um, we see a lot of times sin is kind of behind the scenes if, if we are sinning and um, you know God might not forgive me for this abortion because it's so huge but really there is no sin that's too great you know God forgives all of us mm. or all of it when he just died on the cross um, so the name of the organization Colorado for life mm -hmm. be their village um, this is something that you've been doing for how many years now Colorado for Life is a year old okay um, we started at the beginning of COVID which was kind of an interesting yeah. year to start and, um, and you delivered testimony, state legislature in mm -hmm, Colorado, so, mm -hmm. so public advocacy yeah. at the same time as you're in the community and helping women who are in yeah. crisis. Um, final question, um, you know, for, for those right now who are listening, how, uh, how would you encourage young Christian women to get involved in the pro-life movement? There's a number of ways, obviously. There's um, legislation that you can get involved in. There's also the hands-on stuff with mm -hmm. women, whether that's um, counseling or working at a pregnancy resource center, volunteering your time, doing diaper drives. Uh, for me personally, what kind of birth be their village was uh, a woman messaged me on Instagram and told me that a pro-life post that I had made caused her to cancel her abortion appointment. And for me, that was kind of God's way of saying, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Mm. And um, her canceling that appointment led me to connect to my pro-life family and followers that I have on social media and said, hey, what do you guys think about blessing her? And mm. uh, she, she canceled her appointment, the appointment of which she had because she was scared of not having enough finances and resources due to losing her job in COVID. And um, we were able to fill a baby registry within an hour or two. Wow. Crib, uh, stroller, car seat, you name it. Like everything that she needed to get off on the right foot was mm. filled and they were ready to do it again. Wow. So I started Be Their Village. That's awesome. Well, Christine, thank you for your story. Thank you for your courage. Noah, thank you for coming on. And now we're gonna hear from someone who is here locally about how you can get involved in the pro-life movement in your community. We have the executive director of the Blue Ridge Crisis Pregnancy Center, Susan Campbell. 61.6 million abortions in the U.S. represent the consequences of Roe versus Wade. The Blue Ridge Pregnancy Center exists to save lives and comfort those involved in unplanned pregnancies while furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are pro-baby, pro-woman, and pro-abundant life. Statistics show that fear, guilt, and shame, along with financial worries, are the top factors that motivate a woman to terminate. We believe that offsetting those worries with love and compassion and seeds of hope that lives can truly be changed through the power of Jesus Christ. Our organization can also provide the resources that are needed to physically care for their baby in the first year of life at no charge to our clients. Not only can we provide a lab quality pregnancy test and limited obstetrical ultrasound, all for free, we can take their hand and help walk them through the most difficult decision of their life, partnering that with hope and compassion and the gospel. 
Last year, we saved 180 lives, 23 spiritual lives of the women that we served. But what about the woman who has already made the decision to terminate and lives with the lingering side effects of being post-abortive? One in four women who identify themselves as in the church have had an abortion and continue to suffer in silence for the fear and judgment and shame by fellow believers. Two thirds of my generation alone is missing since Roe versus Wade legalized abortion in 1973. So we offer hope and healing for those circumstances through a post-abortion Bible study so that post-abortive women can be forgiven and set free from the bondage of a regretful choice. Let me take a moment and share a story with you from this past year. She came into our center in August for a pregnancy test. She did not want to be pregnant. At her appointment, she told her client advocate that growing up, she had been abused by her stepfather, and because of this, she had struggled consistently throughout her life with depression and anxiety. She also told her advocate that she was in a complicated relationship with a married man, and he did not want her to carry this baby to term. When her test came back positive, she said that she could not be a mother because she had never been loved by her own parents and she did not know how to love or care for a baby. Her situation seemed hopeless. She had no support from the father of the baby or her family, and she was struggling with her mental health. She could barely make her rent each month. But after much encouragement and support from our team and hearing about how much the Lord loved and valued her, the life inside of her, she chose life for her baby. She enrolled in our parenting and life skills classes where she was able to learn about a healthy pregnancy and get all the baby items that she needed to support a child. During one of those classes, she was able to share that she was having suicidal thoughts along with deep guilt. Immediately, our team jumped in into action. Our nurse manager followed her to the hospital to make sure she got the help that she needed. Her advocate counselor and PLS mentor and our nurse manager followed up with her consistently. After a few work, weeks after this event, she tested positive for COVID-19 and had to quarantine alone over Thanksgiving. Our staff coordinated with her and dropped off her very own Thanksgiving dinner. Since then, she has completed our parenting and life skills classes, received a baby shower celebrating this life, and has started attending a local church. You see, this story encompasses our whole mission at the Blue Ridge Pregnancy Center. We want to empower our client to choose life, and we want to bridge the gap between us and the community to help meet their physical, emotional, and spiritual needs so that we can all live out the abundant life Christ offers to us all. Hey, y'all. My name is Melanie, and I'm a member of the LU Shepherd team here at Liberty. I know that this topic is sensitive and personal for many of you. You might even be experiencing feelings of shame or guilt about decisions you have made or even considering making at this point in your life. We just want you to know that our team, our staff, the LU Shepherd office, we're here for you. We're here for prayer, we're here for support and resources, and we'd love an opportunity to minister to you directly. So if you would email lushepherd at liberty.edu, we can connect you with a staff member who will walk alongside you um, as this, this season of your life is, is occurring. And we just want you to know that we care about you um, and we love you. Hey, we're thankful for the testimonies you just heard and the fact that there are so many counseling services out there for people involved in abortion. And we want you to know that it's one thing to be against abortion, but it's a completely different thing to be pro-life. That's the coolest thing about Jesus is that he comes to bring life and bring life more abundantly. If you've ever been affected by abortion or a post-abortive, whether directly or indirectly, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, it's so amazing what the cross brings to us and then what we can then bring to other people. You know, thinking about our cultural moment, years ago, Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said in Nazi Germany, it's not enough to help hurting people. We must also stop the things that hurt them. One of the best ways for us to stop the things that are hurting these mothers and hurting these unborn babies is to use our collective voice to be a voice, to speak the truth in love. That's what the Liberty Life March is all about. In front of the Montview building, I'm actually gonna drop the dead weight, I'm gonna throw my jacket on, and I'm gonna get out there with you. So go ahead, skip the rot, come on out there with us. I told him not to bring his jacket as a prop. 
It's cold. Because we're doing a video here. So I won't be there. I'm sending my twin sister in my place. But like you said, skip the rot. It'll be open when, you're, when, it's, when it's done. We'll see you out at Montview.